benchmarking is kind of hard, actually. So yesterday I published this video on the Minisform MSR1, and today, and most of yesterday, I've been retesting everything on it, uh, just to reconfirm some of my uh, conclusions, and also to uh, make sure that the, the tests that I was running were completely fair and equal with all the other platforms I test. This is a weird board because it's new, uh, well, it's it's new as of this year. This is the Radsa Orion 06. I finally got this AI box for it or whatever. Sorry, you can't see that very well. I'll show some footage of me setting it up. Um, I tested this earlier this year and I had the same problems where it has high idle power consumption. I tested 14 watts on this and 17 watts minimum on that. And that's probably because that box has Wi-Fi built in and it has dual 10 gig NICs. Uh, with the 10 gig NICs active, it was like 18 or 19 watts, but with them not active, it's 16.9 to 17.0 watts. And it was funny, today I was uh, looking at this review from uh, from NAS Compares, which, uh, you know, that, that channel has a lot of great videos on these things. And I was watching and he said, and I got uh, one to two watts uh, when it's not doing anything. I'm like, one to two watts? If it did that, that would change a lot of conclusions about both of these systems for me. Well, his one to two watts at idle was when it was in standby or sleep mode. So that's different. If you're gonna watch his video, he has a lot of great information in there and I recommend watching that video. But when you say idle, that can mean different things to different people. So just keep that in mind. And uh, the other thing is when I'm benchmarking, I have a whole set of standard benchmarks. So if you go to my SBC reviews website, uh, this website has the benchmarks that I run for every single system that I test with all the details. And when I do it, I also document every little detail about the system, how I tested it, any quirks, any problems, uh, any confusion. And the crazy thing is with like with every single ARM system I test, there's something weird. Even the Raspberry Pis, I have a couple of them sitting back there. Raspberry Pis, uh, RADSA devices. Here's the box for the Orion right there. Um, there's the Thelio Astra hanging out there. I've actually been, <laughs> I've been spending most of the day today trying to get Ubuntu reinstalled on it with many uh, hilarious problems there. Every ARM system is different. And that's something that uh, for me, it's a fun challenge. For a lot of people, it's frustrating. And that's why a lot of times it's like, yeah, maybe you don't want to go ARM. And that's why I said in my conclusion, let me turn on this light so you can see. That's why I said in my conclusion on this box that I think if you're an ARM enthusiast, this is a great box. But uh, if you're not, then it's not a great value. And I stand by that regardless of how my benchmarks uh, turn out today. But I'm retesting the top 500 HPL benchmark because I had about a minute of the video dedicated to that result and how inefficient it was. And when I uh, posted the video, a couple of people mentioned in, in this main issue, that the testing may have not been using the right optimizations for high performance linpack. So I actually have been retesting. I've tested, when I put a video out, I want to be 100% accurate. So I always have reproducible tests. I put all my test data up here and that way people can call me out when I do have something wrong. And in this case, I didn't have anything wrong per se, but I did do something that was not optimal and that caused my test results to be wildly off. So, you know, I was getting like 45 gigaflops, 24 gigaflops with uh, four cores, uh, 45 for eight cores. And I was getting all these wild results depending on which cores I was using on the CPU because this the six CPU, so this, this 06 has the same CPU. It has, <laughs> you can even see it on here, it's confusing. There's a quad big Cortex A720, a quad medium Cortex A720, and a quad little Cortex A520. And it says it has L3 shared cache across all cores, but from looking at the performance, uh, something's funny with the way that level three and level two cache is shared. When you have a CPU like that, this is not like a Threadripper or something, but when you have a CPU like the one in here, that's using big, medium, and little cores. Linux doesn't even know how to deal with all that, much less our silly human brains. Anyway, so that's why I was doing all that testing. And uh, eventually, you know, somebody suggested throwing in this option. Bliss is a, a high-performance algebra math library that you use to run high-performance computing stuff. And uh, it has these optimizations for different architectures. So 
I ran it and I forced the Cortex A57 architecture, which has uh, ARM NEON instructions. And uh, if you don't know what any of this means, that's fine. Uh, I only barely know what any of this means. But anyway, uh, Cortex A57 forces it to add NEON instructions. And so I ran this and all of a sudden I was getting 120 gigaflops. I was getting uh, 134 gigaflops. I was getting 141 gigaflops. So all of a sudden I was getting way different results and uh, efficiency numbers that are that are finally better than the Raspberry Pi. It's still not as good as Rockchip, still way below Apple. Uh, but anyway, I got these way better numbers. So I quickly deleted a section of my video the, the minute that I was talking about that because it's, it's invalid data. I wish YouTube would let us put a note on the screen or do something because it's like, you know, whatever, that's, that's YouTube. On my blog, I went in and immediately deleted that section and I put a note in. Um, and I'll be updating this after I'm finished with all this testing. Uh, and then I put a comment, uh, I pinned a comment on the video at the top that, that talked about all this stuff. Anyway, all this to say that benchmarking is not actually as easy as you'd think. Like a lot of people are like, oh yeah, Geekbench, just run that and you get a number. Yeah, numbers are great, but understanding what's going on in these benchmarks, seeing the performance, like this is why I like BTOP, it's, it's showing me. Can you guess which cores are smaller cores and which cores are the big cores? It's scheduling more work on the big cores, so those are stuck at 100%, and the little cores seem to be having issues like getting data in and out of cache. And that's why we are speculating on how the level 2 and level 3 caches work on this chip. And that's another reason why this chip is weird and hard, I think, for 6 to get uh, working in low power modes, because you have all these the big, medium, and little cores and all that. Anyway, all that to say that benchmarking is not as easy as you would think, when you're trying to do good, reproducible, and uh, scrutinizable benchmarks. So that's why I also do, I do about 20 standard benchmarks, and then I do some other benchmarks too. A lot of times vendors will give you their own benchmarks and their own numbers and things, and a lot of reviewers will just use those and run with them. It's That's not a good idea because <laughs> vendors can often either lie intentionally or uh, be deceptive. And on top of that, all the benchmarks that I run, I am automating using uh, Pi Infra, which is not Ansible, you might note. And you can run the same benchmarks. My, my whole goal with this is that all the benchmarks that I can run, you could buy the exact same system, you could set it up, and then you can run all the exact same benchmarks that I'm running the exact same way that I'm running them. And I even document how I test power. I have these third reality smart outlets that measure the power. Those go into Home Assistant, and Home Assistant measures the power. And if I click on this, I can even get an average for a run. I just hover over this, and it'll give me like a five minute average that I can use in my results. So this one would be 40.3 watts, whenever that finishes. And uh, eventually, so I, I'm still trying to improve some of these things. I have this much nicer power meter over here that has serial data output, and eventually I want to have a test bench set up where I could get like a very, very precise measurement of how many joules goes into a test run. Uh, but for now, all of my old data uses wattage because I used to just read off a kilowatt meter. And that was not very, uh, very accurate compared to this, at least where it logs the data. To me, this is a very stressful thing. I, I don't want to have information in one of my videos or in one of my blog posts that's not 100% accurate, reproducible, and makes sense. And that's why I mentioned in the video, it was confusing performance. I was confused by why it was performing that way. And I think part of the reason is with these newer chips, these six chips, uh, since they're all using like vendor provided OS installs, and uh, like if you run Ubuntu, you're gonna get different performance results. Or if you run uh, Ubuntu 2504 or 2510 or 2404, that might change things too. So th there you go. I mean, when you're benchmarking ARM, it's a lot different than benchmarking uh, standard x86 stuff. And if you're going deeper than like Cinebench and uh, Time Spy and all, all the things where you click a button and then you get a number at the end, even that can be very complicated, uh, even if you're just working on x86. So there are some YouTube channels that I watch that I enjoy the process and other ones where it's painful to see when they list their benchmarks. So yeah, that's uh, that's one benchmark and this has been about uh, 20 hours of extra testing after the video was released to try to make sure that the benchmark is accurate. So I'll be updating my blog post and that's level two, Jeff. Here's my, that's, that's a weird wave, but I'm waving to you. Goodbye. Sorry, I had to come back for a minute. I am trying to uh, get this 
06 up to the latest firmware and here's another one of those fun fun things about these arm dev boards and uh, yes they are definitely dev boards if you want to upgrade the firmware you there's if you run radso's os which i'm not doing i want to run debian or ubuntu or, or whatever and that was an adventure i actually had to download two things to get uh, debian to actually install on here and that took me about an hour this morning to finally get Debian going, but I'm running the 9.0.0 system ready firmware right now, and I wanted to upgrade to the latest firmware, which I've heard is like 1.0.0-3 or something, which I found on their GitHub finally, but you can't just install this through the OS, you have to do this process, and there's three different ways to get the fir there's three different firmwares. There's like the 0.030-1, which was the one that I tested a while back, there's 9.0.0 that I'm on right now. And then there's the, I guess this is the latest one, that you have to like download the dev file, extract some stuff, copy some stuff to a USB drive, put the USB drive in here, go into the UAFI shell and do all this stuff. Now, PC BIOSes aren't always the most wonderful to upgrade, but most vendors have had a better flashing process. Just frustrating. I couldn't put this thing down. Uh, something else that is a little bit annoying about this AI PC case thing is if you ever want to maintain it, you have to take off these corner pads, which at least at first are pretty well stuck on there. And this is just like, seriously, why would you design something? This is like, ugh, so annoying. And I was like, okay, maybe I can just not put these pads on, but the way this is designed thermally, uh, thermally, it pulls the air in from the bottom. And if you look at this, if I set it down without the pads, it's going to basically cut off all of the airflow. Also, if you set this down on a surface that's not perfectly flat with the pads, it'll cut off all the air intake and uh, the exhaust goes out the back there. The reason I'm taking this apart is it kept locking up after I upgraded the new firmware and I wasn't 100% sure why, but I was reading on the forums that some people with this AI PC case thing that uh, Radza makes, they said that the heatsink is too high off of the platform and that causes the thing to overheat and maybe that's causing the lockups. I don't know. I have put in uh, six hours today on this machine and I, I got it booting and then now it's locking up after I upgraded firmware. And so is that the new firmware, the 1.0.0-3? Is it something in the OS? Is it something, is it like the phase of the moon or the Earth's alignment with the stars? I don't know. But this is the fun thing that I, uh, people are always like, why do you do things on Raspberry Pis? Raspberry Pis work. Like, that's the thing. I I don't know if it's my incompetence, which it sure could be, uh, or if it's like something is wrong in the firmware, something's wrong in the hardware, but I'm going to check if this heat sink is not actually touching the CPU, causing it to throttle or lock up. Well, it was making some contact. The uh, thermal compound was was stuck on there at least so there was there was contact there someone in the forums mentioned that they put a copper shim in so i'm going to try that with a 0.3 millimeter copper shim just to give more surface contact because it looked like at least in the middle it was making contact but you don't want to bridge a thick gap with a thermal compound you want something that can transfer the heat a little better so we're going to try with this and see if we get more stability so now after the bio screen we have a locked up solid cursor. And I wonder if I completely screwed up the thing by adding the copper shim. I don't know. I'm try rebooting again. Let's see what happens. Hold down the power button. We're just going to go, well, let's see, max frequency. I'm going to set it to 2.5 gigahertz. We'll try booting again. Shimming it does seem to have helped the temperatures. We're now down at 34 degrees. It was at 42 to 45 degrees uh, without the shim at idle. So we'll see how it performs now uh, with the firmware updated, the shim installed, all that kind of stuff, all in the name of updating one graph on a blog post that had some information that might not be complete. So yeah, we're gonna see how this goes. So a few days later, what we found out was Bliss is applying automatically uh, the ARM SVE configuration for these chips because they're newer and they support SVE. And uh, the problem is that the way that Bliss does that, it assumes that you're using like 256-bit or 512-bit, and these, these newer but lower-end chips only support 128-bit vectors. 
So using the older ARM Cortex A57 instructions for Neon actually helps them go faster, and that's why we're getting the better benchmarks. And it's more in line with how the actual performance of these boards works. Anyway, all that to say, I get lots of ARM development boards. These are just a few. I grabbed these off the pile. These were the ones on the top. There's more buried beneath them. And th the problem is that every ARM, almost every ARM board that I get, you get it from a vendor, and it might not even have any OS installed. It might not have an official OS yet. It might have a buggy thing that requires you to plug it into a Windows computer and use Chinese software to put the OS onto it. All these different things. And you know, it's like, I would love to have a very complete database of all these different boards. But sometimes, if I can't get it going within a day, I just give up on it at this point. There's, there's more to life than spending all of your time trying to debug these ARM dev boards from all these companies. So when a device like the MSR1 or the Orion 06 comes out with massive claims about what it can do and what it's going to change and how it's an AI thing and all this stuff, I'm interested. Uh, but I'm starting to get a little more numb to that marketing because I found that even with the bigger systems, sometimes there's things, there's gotchas that they don't advertise these things because they're not good marketing. And I do still have some optimism for some of these boards, like the MSR1 and the Orion 06 both if 6 and if Minisform and Radsa all put support behind them, they could be very interesting boards. But right now, they just don't move the needle for me when you have things like the Apple M series. Uh, or on the lower end, you can get uh, rock chip boards that offer much better efficiency and still have enough performance for a lot of the things that I want to do. Anyway, that's level 2 Jeff, and I'm rambling now and uh, ranting a little bit. But sometimes it's nice to vent a little steam.